Wow, 15,000 views? I never would have guessed this would be my most popular video so far. Kinda goes to show that Total Drama isn't a franchise to be underestimated. The classic format is coming back soon, after a long period of experimentation. But why did it have to experiment? And was their first spin-off a good evolution of the series? For those who've waited patiently, take a ride with me back to Total Drama in review. Total Drama, Revenge of the Island, and all later seasons and iterations eluded me growing up. I was perfectly content with where they left it at the end of World Tour, despite a couple odd breakups and loose ends, and was afraid to accept a new cast or take a huge step back in scope. I was 10 when it started, and although I hadn't been watching them for most of my life or anything, I'd grown too attached to the Gen 1 cast to see them get retired. But now, I think it was kind of wise. Some of these characters had done everything they could, and the others had gone through so much physical and later mental trauma that it's reasonable that giving them a break would be a positive creative decision, and in universe, ethically sound. I remember swallowing my pride and watching the first episode on YouTube, then the internet cut out partway through the opening. I saw that as a sign Revenge of the Island wasn't for me, and held off going back to it for nine years. But how true was I? Contestants aside, are the things I like about Total Drama still present in Season 4? It's our roughest, toughest, most explosive season ever! Charismatically cruel host Chris McLean has duped another 13 teenagers into staying on Camp Wawanakwa to compete in challenges and put up with each other's quirks. Anne Maria, B, Breck, Cameron, Dakota, Dawn, Joe, Lightning, Mike, Sam, Scott, Stacy, and Zoe. The catch being that since being abandoned early on in season two, it's become a nuclear waste dump, and its life and land are now heavily mutated. 13 new contestants, 17 different personalities, two teams in the form of the toxic rats and mutant maggots, one location that's more dangerous than ever before. How do they handle it? Chris McLean continued being himself, a narcissist with a wicked sense of humor, and while I'm not starting to hate his reprehensible actions or anything, he has less of a rapport with the second gen cast than he ever did with the first. He did start to feel like an acquaintance to Gwen, Owen, Duncan, etc. before too long. Not so much with Zoe, Scott, Cameron, etc. This can be chalked up to there being less episodes in this season, but also this being the only season in which some of these characters compete, so there's a bit of an empty feeling. It's especially noticeable with Chef Hatchet, who doesn't even have lines for a good chunk of the season. Again, I'm not saying they've been ruined, but they feel less dynamic with the second gen cast to me. That doesn't mean anything about whether I like or dislike them. Anne Maria is a Jersey diva who's never seen without her hairspray or attitude. She's one of those characters that I wasn't necessarily attached to, but I like her well enough, even if she can be more on the plot device side. B is a big, friendly dude who doesn't speak. I like him too, but come on, a character who can't speak is not going to stick around for very long. I just knew that instinctively. Still, what little time he has on the show remains precious. Brick's a military man who's always pushing his team and himself to their physical breaking points. Not one of my favorites, but again, I see the appeal. Cameron is a self-proclaimed bubble boy, growing up very nervous, diffident, and sheltered. And he's more like it. He's got a good personality and problems to overcome, and spends as much time overcoming them as he needs. Dakota loves fame and attention. Too bad she can't get any of that on the island. They start off portraying her as somewhat arrogant, but beat down on her more and more over time. Maybe a bit too much? As long as she's happy in the end? Eh? Dawn is a mystic child who can read people's auras. Like B. She's a very nice presence and is very underutilized. She could have had a much larger presence on the show, but alas, only a few episodes in a shorter season. Joe is an androgynous athlete with a spiky personality. Her chemistries are what really make her, especially the rivalry she has with Brick and how she bounces off Lightning, another athletic character, only more dim-witted. 
He does a lot of pretty annoying things, like prefixing most sentences with sh, but he has an intimidating side that gets a little more explored. Not to its fullest potential, but enough for you to understand him a bit better. Mike is an interesting character in that he's six. He has multiple personality disorder and begins acting like someone else when he gets triggered. The main Mike is a shy but friendly guy. Chess is an old grouch who's always complaining. Svetlana is a professional gymnast. Vito's a self-absorbed tough guy. And Manitoba's a brave Australian explorer. Although their appearances are humorous and I like them all, five different personalities felt like a bit much for them to juggle. They're certainly taking the disorder's effect on Mike's life seriously though. It isn't just a wacky quirk for the heck of it. Sam is the awesome gamer dude who says and does some awesome gamer things. I mean, I can appreciate them putting a total nerd like this in the show, and he's not an awful character or anything, just underwhelming in a couple ways. Scott serves as the drama stirrer of the season. Being a country boy with a large family, he's very fierce and manipulative. He goes to show the back to basics elements of Revenge of the Island. He's pretty much a rural guy version of Heather. Not bad at all, but he seemed familiar. Stacy's main thing is that she cannot shut up about her extended family for the life of her, and annoys her teammates so much that she's voted off in the first episode. She may very well be the contestant with the least screen time, and frankly, least chance of going anywhere. Last of all, Zoe is their second attempt at bringing a big fan onto the show, and I think she was more successful. Largely. I felt she could be pretty dumb at points, but she makes it clear she's here to make friends, though that mindset is put to the test as the season goes on. Overall, I don't like the second gen contestants as much as the first, but that could just be bias, as this is not a bad lineup. I'd probably be less biased if Chris didn't bring back the classic contestants once in a while to show they could still be good fun. Owen and Ezekiel sneak their way back onto the camera, and Izzy, Bridget, Lindsay, Duncan, DJ, Gwen, and Heather are brought back as co-hosts or test subjects. And they're still as fun as ever. I remember a friend telling me that Izzy came back as a spider, and I spent nine years not knowing what he meant. Oh yeah! Do I got style or what? Oh. Um, I agree with the maggot. As I mentioned, the episode count was shortened, getting cut in half from 26 to 13. Plus, season 1 and 2 had specials that set up what the next season would do, which they didn't do for 3. So you're thrown into this new cast and setting blind. The challenges and writing are the same as ever, however, most of the story arcs come on too strong, and they don't have the time to naturally worm their way into the season. It makes the pacing of it feel more brisk. A lot of the arcs are good ideas that aren't developed as far as the others. There's a rivalry between Joe and Brick that gets phased out when Brick leaves, slowly overtaken by Joe having to put up with Lightning's dumb thoughts and actions and misgenderings. It's debatable whether you can call this an arc, but it gives us more situations for Joe to be in, so it counts towards something. Scott becomes the new, new Heather, making fake alliances and backstabbing his teammates and whatnot, and he gets away with it much worse for more of the season, until his feud with a local shark, Fang, meets a grisly end. Very grisly for a show aimed at tweens, but really damn satisfying all the same. Dakota and Sam hit it off, and stay friends even when Dakota's reduced to an intern, then a bold intern, then a radioactive monster. Two morals to the story. Beauty comes in all forms, and Sam likes monster girls. And if Bowsette has taught us anything, that is totally normal. The most straightforward story arc is Cameron coming out of his shell and embracing the punches life can pull at ya, but the most prevalent is Mike and Zoe's romantic relationship. There's this whole will they, won't they because Zoe doesn't know about Mike's disorder and thinks he's just a really intense LARPer who keeps abandoning her. While frustrating, the payoff is immense, with Zoe going Songtra Bong mode out of her rage towards Scott. It's a very dramatic transformation, and one I was happy to see get some closure to. Before I get to my favourite and least favourite episodes, time to tolerate the animation. I still think it looks fine, the character designs are still detailed and feel like they belong in this world, but the animation production is starting to look a bit dated. 
and I mean for the time. While the season entered production in 2010, under the name Total Drama Reloaded, it aired throughout 2012 in both halves of North America. They were competing with The Amazing World of Gumball, Gravity Falls, and TMNT 2012 now, and it didn't look much better than when it started. The writing is more important than the animation at the end of the day, as will soon be seen. It was starting to feel strange up against US cartoons. By Canadian standards, it's still good, but I can understand why the US viewers would have started drifting away from it. Starting the good stuff off simple, Truth or Laser Shark is a string of simple classic challenges, mixed with some simple classic character introductions. This is where I started to like the trajectory they were going, which is good to do two episodes in. A mine is a terrible thing to waste is pretty good too. Splitting all the characters up in a mine made for a more dynamic story than you'd think, and Anne-Marie's banter with Ezekiel is pretty funny too. I felt like they finally found out how to use her greatly. Up up and away in my pitiful balloon is where we start to get the more dramatic and tense side of the season in full swing. It felt like everyone was equally skilled in this challenge, so it was really anyone's game. And I love when I get that feeling from a challenge. This is also Heather's return appearance, and she hasn't changed a bit. The Enchanted Frankenforest is my favourite episode of Season 4. Time moves on, but I'm still a sucker for the penultimate rounds. There's so much character and action in this one in particular. Not to mention, the scenery is wonderful for this show, and the way Chris adds levity to this situation is nice too. It makes sense that Larry is the one and only creature he truly cares for. Because of the short length of the season, Brain vs Brawn, the ultimate showdown, also sticks out more as a finale. It's weird that they turn it into an Iron Man parody, but it's great for many reasons, seeing Cameron get into such a scuffle, humanizing Lightning just enough for him to be more interesting, and seeing Chris get arrested for polluting the island. Every season before this, there'd be some sort of retaliation or joke the contestants would get on him, like pranking the Dean on the last day of school. But this goes to show that even though the setting's more insular, the stakes are still rising. My least favorite episodes of Revenge were largely caused by Scott, Backstab as a hoy just made Mike look like a doormat and Zoe look like an idiot, and Grand Chef Orsho even more so. It's episodes like this that made me feel like Scott got away with a bit too much in ratio to how much development Mike and Zoe got, which went to show the weaknesses to the season's shorter length. Revenge of the Island is much more compact, so you get those highs and lows come at you faster with less time to sink in. It's okay but it felt like a big downgrade compared to World Tour. Hopefully these new characters and dynamics can be explored further and better next season? After a year, Chris is released from prison and put in charge of a new season of Total Drama, featuring the return of fan-favorite characters and fan-favorite challenges in the fan-favorite setting Camp Wawanakwa. And fans hated this season! Alejandro, Cameron, Courtney, Duncan, Gwen, Heather, Joe, Lightning, Lindsay, Mike, Sam, Scott, Sierra, and Zoe all returned, and instead of doing new things that could constitute as character development, they all went through the same arcs they did in prior seasons, or made unrecognizable choices. This is what we call character assassination. The scene that serves as a big red flag is the way Lindsay votes herself off again, without any legit choice or reaction. The World Tour characters were seriously muted. Sierra has gone from a creepy fangirl who learned to love Corey for who he was as a person, back to a creepy fangirl who constantly cries over not getting to see Cody. And Alejandro's intelligence and bravery, which were essential to his villainy and arc in Season 3, were abandoned quickly. On that subject, the teams are split into heroes and villains this season with Gwen put on the villain's team just to make her feel like a worse person than she is. Duncan, Cameron, Joe, Scott, I could go on and on about the ways these characters were reduced to stereotypes of their former selves, but the big story arc of the season I have to criticize is with Mike. On the new season, Duncan recognizes him as a serious threat from his time in Juvie, and it's soon revealed he has an evil personality called Mao who does nothing shockingly evil other than whistle in the Hall of the Mountain King. Must be a really big fan of Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. 
There's this whole conspiracy going around that Mal is the original personality and Mike is one of the made up ones. His relationship with Zoe is ruined again, making her look way too naive for someone who's been his girlfriend for at least a year. And it's all intercut with sequences inside Mike's head where he rounds up all the other split personalities, faces off against Mal, and pushes a reset button at the end to erase his split personality disorder for good. It's bad. None of this understands or capitalizes on the appeal of total drama. This all feels like something was intruding on their world and stories. Beneath the crap, there are a few good things I can say about Total Drama All-Stars. I like the new opening shot of Camp Wawanakwa, and the victory reward of staying in a nice mansion brings back some of those world tour vibes. I'm also not against the whole Boney Island exile mechanic. Even if it feels like they're lifting it from another reality show instead of integrating something new into their world, one of the episodes that I think worked to a degree was Food Fright. I just like the challenges. And while this is where some of the dynamics start to get really far-fetched, there are a few callbacks I like, such as bringing back Courtney's fear of gelatin. Suckers Punched is where all the contestants have to duke it out with their worst fears. While Alejandro is spayed and the Mal backstory gets more confusing, just put Izzy there and I'm more entertained. And again, the challenge is a little creative. At least more creative than a marathon of total drama all-stars. Moon Madness has some nice lighting, but is otherwise a pretty bad time. How the blue Harvest Moon gimmick affects Mike is poorly explained. I can see right through the stuff with Heather and Alejandro. And why keep going with the Gwen, Duncan, Courtney love triangle if they're just going to make it worse? I was excited for Zeke and Ye Shall Fine, with it being a milestone celebration with a fun premise. But apart from the banter between Chris and Ezekiel, this is a mess, plain and simple. The Obstacle Hill course continues on from that mess, with the Mal arc really overstaying its welcome. Alejandro has a whole day to prove Mal's antics, but doesn't, because he has to live up to his namesake. Lastly, The Final Reckoning might just be the worst episode of Total Drama for how slapdash all its elements feel. They were really strapped for time, and ended up destroying Camp Wawanakwa in the process. Was it pure shock value? Or did the team have good creative intentions? Experiamus! I know many spells to ward off evil. Oh. Good? I'm sorry for calling this place Pikachu Island in the first review rather than Pukatio Island, but I will now call it Pikachu Island. A third generation of the cast is introduced, whom Chris and Chef have even less chemistry with, and put on the team's floating salmon and confused bears. This is what you get for using a free online translator. <laughs> My bad. Time to bring back the lightning round because they're pretty easy to describe. Evil twin scenario that's put to rest too early. Beatboxer extraordinaire feels too much like B. Wow, what a compelling character. Go back to the 30s. I like her a lot actually. The intention's nice, but the character is so one note. Remember when the show was about normal teenagers? Kind of interesting, but only kind of. Part of a nice twist, but again, remember when it was about normal teenagers and characters like Izzy were major exceptions that stuck out well and you could still be invested in the others as if they were normal people? Would have been a good example if the cast wasn't already so crazy. It's hard to remember anything about her other than her gas. I'll come back to you on her. This is my favorite character of the season because he actually has a substantial chemistry with Chris. So overall, not as strong of a cast as before for many reasons. The big one being that the arcs are, once again, poorly paced. The Amy and Sammy debacle is fun, but could have lasted longer so we could learn more about them. The romance between Dave and Skye has nothing going for it, and Sugar is one of the most obnoxious characters I've ever seen in my time as employee Emilian after 37 series reviews. As a parody of Honey Boo Boo and Southern tropes, she gets onto my skin. As a villain, she gets onto that layer of skin. She was definitely the contestant they tried to give the largest personality and impact on events, and they sure succeeded, for better or worse. There's some good things scattered throughout the season, like Sean and Jasmine's chemistry has its bright spots. And again, Topher being a total kiss up to Chris was a really fun dynamic, testing how much admiration he could take. But it's not that big of an improvement over the previous season slash first part of the same season. 
Were they strapped for cash? What was with all the 13 episode contests? Pikachu Island was a mixed bag. Some good and lousy episodes, but mostly middle of the road. I Love You Grease Pig was a fun one. The challenge is very entertaining and evenly matched, and they managed to make pigs cute. That should be an award, cutest pigs in animation. I Love You, I Love You Knots has another lovely affectionate title, and is the spiciest episode of the season. That's not saying much, but they were able to go somewhere with Rodney's awkward interactions, and the Truth or Dare challenge. Scarlet Fever is the most exciting episode of Pikachu Island, because we learn that the island's not what it appears to be at all, of Chris's personal robot army made to take care of total drama fans, and Scarlet finally becomes interesting. It was fun while it lasted. But man, the second half of the season was also not too pretty. Three Zones and a Baby is all about a babysitting challenge, and is really brought down for me by Max's baby talk. This was a low point in his potential villainy, and it doesn't help that the challenge isn't a super funny idea. Skyfall has the tension and drama, but also one of the biggest leaps in fairness so far. I know the patterns of the show by this point, I know they want to keep Sugar around for as long as they possibly can, but it's still frustrating when that's sort of an episode's main point. But after this, total drama ended. Chris made it clear in the final episode that he was going on vacation after Pikachu Island, and it's been a seven year long vacation so far. Total drama lived on in two spin-offs, the first of which is the most faithful, The Redonkulous Race. The Redonkulous Race is another reality show within the Total Drama universe, hosted by some guy named Don, where 18 teams of contestants of all ages have to travel around the world a la The Amazing Race, finding hints and going through challenges and fighting tennis dialects to win a million dollars. They still haven't adjusted for inflation, what chumps? With a cast of 36 contestants and one new host, I'll just describe the teams to save time and end with the host this time. The Adversity Twins, Jay and Mickey, are like Cameron, only way more sheltered. They work and are on the show for the right amount of time to grow. The Best Friends, Devin and Carrie, are one of the many pairings whose relationship starts out fine but drags on. Good intentions, but they can be pretty dumb. The Daters, Stephanie and Ryan, get caught under so much pressure that they eventually become the haters. Again, very drawn out and much more mean-spirited, but when they regain some awareness of their dynamic, they can be pretty funny. The fashion bloggers, Tom and Jen, weren't interesting enough to stick around for as long as they did. They like fashion, let the comedy commence. Father and son, Dwayne and Junior, were my favorite team. Great chemistry, pretty fresh dynamic for the show, and you can really be invested in their bond. The geniuses, Elodie and Mary, are like less evil versions of Scarlet, caught up in science and statistics, which gets some good jokes out of them and lands them in some fun trouble. The Goths, Ennui and Crimson, are a hilarious duo. They're so low energy, but get into so many great situations. The Ice Dancers, Jose and Jacques, are the main antagonist team and they're fine as villains until they stick around too long and don't get punched as hard as their predecessors. The LARPers, Leonard from Pikachu Island and his friend Tammy, knock out predictable geek jokes and are basically roster filler. You don't want it to be too competitive from the start. Mother and daughter, Kelly and Taylor, is another conflict heavy team because Kelly's a doormat to her spoiled daughter. She betters herself a few too many times for me to believe they'll be a better unit when they get home, unfortunately. The police cadets, MacArthur and Sanders, are fun for what they are, inexperienced cops who don't know how to do everything correctly yet. Possibly a blessing? The reality TV pros consist of classic contestants, Owen and Noah, back for more hijinks. Owen, it was great seeing you again after all this time. Noah, it was great being underwhelmed with you again after all this time. The Rockers, Rock and Spud, are junkies in the making, with Spud in particular not being very bright. I came to like them more than I thought I would over time, but I seem to have more fun remembering them than watching them. The Sisters, Kitty and Emma, are another one of my favorite duos. They're just fun to watch interacting with each other and most of the other teams. 
The stepbrothers Lorenzo and Chet are bitter, hateful gamer dudes. They're like the daters, only with a lot less charisma. The surfer dudes, Jeff and Brody, were a wonderful team too. It was a real return to form for Jeff. It's great to see him with a friend that gets him and he can bounce off. The tennis rivals, Jerry and Pete, were fun while they lasted. Not a lot of middle-aged contestants, so you get a very refreshing amount of middle-aged ribbing and humour. Finally, the vegans, Laurie and Miles, are probably the most hip and relevant team. They love animals to the point it's their downfall. And although a bit stereotypical, I'm happy at least one team strive to be culturally sensitive this go around. Closing out the cast is Don, the new host who's considerably less vain and egotistical than Chris, but still is to an extent. After how nutty Chris and his jokes got, I can appreciate Don as a back to basics kind of host, even though he won't say or do anything nearly as memorable. It makes sense in universe why he's here, this is a different show. And I'm happy to think that the intercontestant friendships and rivalries are once again more of a positive than a hindrance. I won't review them because 36 different people. I've already covered them and I'm running out of time and want to get to the standout episodes that portray them. While they weren't able to trounce the scope of World Tour or its scale, it wasn't even match. They go to many new exciting places like Romania, Finland, Vietnam and New Zealand, let's go! Kiwis rise for our national anthem. Representation represents. It's a Matariki miracle. Ah, they're doing the haka. Taking in the culture. Pyo, pyo. It's true. We all wear rugby uniforms. Ha, I got the tattoo joke before they pointed it out. Oh, this is so great to see. We never get reverence in cartoons. Ah, feels good, man. And it feels good to finally get a fully fleshed out 26 episode season again is what I'd be saying if there weren't nine non-elimination rounds. Once in a while that's fine, but it makes 35% of the challenges feel like they don't matter. Still, I think this is a very good season. It's not up there with Island and World Tour, but it goes above Action and Revenge, and well above Season 5. They took a chance and shook things up, and it paid off big time. Then it didn't. But I'm not doing that. One more time? What are my favourite episodes of The Redonkulous Race? It peaks early on with French's Eiffel language, a more entertaining journey through France than last time, complete with a ride on giant cheese wheels, and a caricature challenge. This is pretty early on, so there's a lot of character and new ideas. A ticket, a casket, I'm gonna blow a gasket, is a fun stop in Romania, where a lot of important things happen. The fashion bloggers leave on a well enough note, the ice dancers managed to turn their luck around, beating the old curse trope, and the goths geek out in Transylvania. Down and Out Back kicked off two of the least lucky teams well enough at the right time and, might I say, in the right place. Plus, the rabbit challenge at the start is one of the more mundane but relatable this season. Maori or less is one of my favourite things ever, I think I already laid out a compelling argument for why. Bahama Rama brought one of the best dynamics of the season to a nice end, and almost managed to humanise Jacques and Jose. Just enough for you to remember they're human beings. I generally love the penultimates, but the finale, A Million Ways to Lose a Million Dollars, is a fun ride too, with all the tension through the season finally paying off. I still have a couple least favourites. Jork and Telephone didn't embrace Icelandic culture as much as I would have hoped, with the food being the highlight and really dang gross. The fact it's a non-elimination round makes the gross out feel more pointless. Hawaiian Honey Ruin is brimming with arguments and bad vibes, between the daters and mother and daughter respectively, on top of also kicking off the season's biggest romantic plot humour into full gear. Shawshank Redunction made me pretty mad with how all the characters acted and their actions. The writing felt very flimsy on them this week, and it didn't matter anyway because it was a non-elimination round. You see why it's my biggest problem with the season? They don't drag the season down too far honestly, and I'm happy that for now, the present slash canon world of the show has been left on a good note. It wasn't looking bright for a while there, but I feel like they were able to bounce back and be as exciting and relatable as ever once more. I'll always have a place in my heart for those first three seasons but it feels good knowing that the franchise has managed to prosper and remain popular after so many years. It's coming back again, and we're back on an island setting with Chris and Chef for 13 episodes. 
on one hand, it's good to have this old look and feel back anyway, but the episode count has me a little worried. I'll see what happens, and I'm happy it's back at all. I'll leave you with another bit of advice. Never eat from Jimmy's beaks and feet. Goodbye for now. Coming up next, Sonic Boom on Cartoon Network.